Okay. Brave people. Let's be braver. Um, so I, apart from answering questions or whatever you want to do for some of the time, uh, there's only one thing I really wanted to do together in some detail. Uh, let me let me write again probably the last thing that I that I wrote this morning. Which was after some suffering. Okay, let me see what I can do to lighten up the, the notation a bit. Uh, no, I'm not going to lighten up anything. I had a better one. Ah, oh, no, I didn't. had a better one. <coughs> so the number that comes after five is six, which doesn't exist. Six, seven, okay. Six, seven, eight. Okay. I think there was something that got lost in translation, so. Okay, and at the end, okay. Okay, so that was the, the thing that was missing. 
Okay, so this was about the last thing I wrote, okay? Uh, which already looks fairly compact, okay? And uh, so there's one thing I could, I could do here, which is this integral over Q. Let's just do it to, to get, get it out. If I do the integral over Q, I get rid of this. Uh, yeah, the integral over Q was not even written, which is, uh, and what I have here is that then this is the same coordinate. So I have some M0, um, sorry, the integral that I do, yeah, I have something like this modulus squared. That's really unimportant for what we want to do. So the, the complexity in this, in what's left from this calculation is really calculating these medium averages. That's the only thing. So um, what this tells us, I mean, it, this is easy to read. So in this specific time ordering, the other one is accounted by the factor of two and by taking the real part. What I have is that uh, the emission on the amplitude is before the emission in the complex conjugate amplitude. That's all that is written there. So this one can happen anywhere. This one can only happen up to it so that I respect the time order. Okay. Then I have something that depends on the transverse momentum of the radiated gluon, which just tells me that that momentum is conjugate to the, dis to the displacement of the transverse coordinates at infinity, right? That's what, it's, that's what defines my transverse momentum. Okay, this is, these are the remnants of the vertices here that we wrote. And then I have this sequence of, uh, of propagators and now I do the, the observation that I wanted to, that I uh, already did, is that to perform these medium averages, so these uh, angular parentheses, uh, I should be very aware that these are local in time. So I can break these into um, regions that have a constant number of, uh, of lines appearing there. Okay. So that already gets me one thing out of the way, is that this thing is completely local. I made this um, hard amplitude at a fixed point, okay? So uh, the average of this, whatever there is to do with the average of that will factorize from the rest. So I'm not even going to, to write it here, okay? I'm going to get rid of this. It's, it's n none of our business for what I want to do. And now I'm going to slice the things in, uh, in regions, okay? Let me call region one, region two, region three, uh, the two should, okay. So instead of being an average of this mess, it will be the product of three averages, yeah. So there's one missing, yes. There is one missing right here, yeah. There should be another one here. There was one from the amplitude and one from the con uh, complex conjugate amplitude. Okay, so if I want region one, what of these, so region one is from zero to x1 plus bar. So, this is not there. Uh, none of the gluons is there, right? They don't. So where are the contributions? There is this contribution here. So there is a contribution that is U, I. So this is the region from zero to X1 plus. Or 
yeah, 0 to x1 bar plus. So this is accounted for. And I'm not missing. Ah, and this one. This one, this one here, I should write as two pieces. One from x1 bar plus to x1 plus, and the bit to x1 bar plus coming from zero. Right? Okay, I have to be very careful with the indices. This is inside the trace. So I can't just write things without keeping any indices. So I'm going to take the trace away from here and I'm going to write indices uh, explicitly. I, J, uh, J, K, K, L, L, M, M, I, okay, for, the, for this one. Okay, so what I have here is this one with MI, that one with IJ. So this one, I'm not going to write the, the time support because once I'm doing this, the time support is, is fixed, right, for these, for these pieces. So I'll just be repeating the, the same thing. So this one is IJ and the other one, it's M I. So these are actually contracted, which is, which is good and essential. Okay. So these are two Wilson lines. One is uh, daggered. Okay, so this is the, just the same thing, propagating in two ways. So the only thing that changes is the sign. So when I multiply these things, one by the other, I get one, okay? I get one and one taking into account the color indices. So from here, the only thing I get is that J has to be M or M has to be J. Okay, so um, region one is completely uh, trivial. Only tells me that the color in the amplitude just before the vertex has to be equal to the color uh, in the complex conjugate amplitude. So the color always has to be the same at fixed times, right? Or whatever I have at the fixed time has to be color neutral. Here I only have two lines, it's the only way of making something color neutral. Done. So region one done, I didn't have to do anything. So that's, that's good. Region two is now the, that bit in the middle that goes from x1 plus to bar to x1 plus. So here I have stuff, okay? I have nothing from here, I think, no. But I have something from here. So these I have to write uh, in a more careful way. So these I have to write as a c infinity X, X1 plus bar. At some intermediate coordinate Z, I have to integrate in Z. And then Z, C, B. X1, okay? So, let's be more, let's get the, oh, I was going to get the things out that, uh, that I should have got out, but, uh, That's fine. 
<coughs> okay, so who, who is going to tell me what I have in this region two? So from that bit, I have this, right? I have some, which I'm going to write in a slightly different way. I'm going, because I have the support, I don't have to write these things explicitly. CB, and I'm going to put the transverse coordinates here. Okay? So that's that one done. So what have we done? We've got rid of this one, of that one, of this one. And now Wilson lines in this, uh, in this segment. So Wilson lines in this segment, I'll have this, a bit of this. So this one again has to be, has to be written as U I from And then the bit to infinity. Okay. So I'll, I'll have something. Ooh, I, I was very uncareful with, with indices. So this was actually I, this would be N, this would be N. This would be M. So what I contracted actually was N with J. This should be N. Okay, N with J from there, which means that this can be J. Yeah, so I have that piece, which is MJ. Yeah, which is UI. N J or M J. Yeah. So that's this one taken care of. Okay, and here I should be careful. This should be K O O L. The one I'm using is the KO. So it's U, KO. This is easier in a piece of paper. Um, like that. And none of this is daggered, right? One of these has to be daggered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just see one thing. One, two, three. The dagger went away. No, fine. Yeah. What comes for X or X bar? Uh, X comes first. Okay, so that's the mistake. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, let me... Huh? You know, I have to start over with the labelings, yes. Okay, let me... Okay, let me take this out. And let me take this out, yes. Okay. <coughs> okay. Let's be, let's be patient. Okay. Should have seen that before, no? 
No, you should have. I'm looking at the blackboard. I cannot see anything, OK? Um, OK, and this is to be ignored as well. So let me be a bit more uh, practical about this. Let me write the, the whole chain here with a bit of a light annotation, OK? Already separating the things into this, this region. So let me start with this one. So this is G dagger. This has to be broken in no regions. This is only in region 3. OK? To indicate that, so that's B. And I put just a 3 here. There's only contribution in region 3. OK. And the coordinates of this is x1 bar and x bar. So that's that one. Now, this one needs to be broken into two things. So that one is GAC in region 3. So that's from uh, infinity to x bar plus. And the coordinates are x and z. So I've invented a new integral over an intermediate coordinate. OK. And then I have this in region 2, in this bit here, with indices CB and coordinates are Z and X1. So this, this I think it's right now. OK, and now I'm going to write, so let's keep this a trace for the time being. I'm going to write the trace of u dagger. So this is always y, so I don't need to write it. And that one has to be broken into two regions, right? Because it has region 1 and region 2. So I have region 1, because it's dagger, I write the time ordering uh, opposite. So it's like this in 1 and this in 2. I have a TB bar. Now, this one doesn't go anywhere, right? This one is just one region, yes. So I just have u in region 3, tb. And now this is just region 1. OK. This is easy like this. With one caveat, which cannot be correct. I have something wrong in that expression, I think. Huh? So who are these guys? So the, this first one is this. I cannot hear you, but yeah, I should I should have four, yes. And where is the one I I gave away for adoption? Uh, okay. So there is one that is from 0 
2x1 plus, so that's this one, correct. Then the matrix, that's correct. So actually, actually, this should be written the other way. So this, okay. So from the from the amplitude, what I should have here. So, so these are the ones that come from the amplitude. That's this, and then I need one that goes all the all the way all the way there. Okay which is u, it goes infinity to x1 plus. This is, I just wrote, it's this, the vertex, and this bit, yeah. And now I have to put this bit, okay, which is flipped. So it's something from here to there, which is a joint or a joint, it's staggered, which goes from 0 to x1 bar. Correct. And then I hit the vertex, and I have one that goes to from x1 bar to infinity, yeah. Now this has to be correct. So if I rewrite so if I rewrite that entire train I have u dagger and those are regions three. So this is only region three. Everybody agrees. Yes. Huh? No, I just wrote this backwards, right? So I. Actually, I have to write them backwards, yes. So this should be x1 plus bar, infinity, and this one is from 0 to x1 plus bar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they are mirrored here. Yes. Okay. So this is wrong. So that first one has region 1 and region 2, right? Yeah, this is. It's. No, exactly like this, yes. And then I have this, finally. Okay. This one is just region three, and it's also a dagger. So I have one, two, three, and then the other one should read three, two, one, whatever I do. So that one comes all the way here, so that's. 3 and 2, and TB, and region 1. Okay. Forget about factors of 1 over n. Okay? Now, this actually makes it, makes it quite easy already to get rid of a few things. Because these and these are talking are contracted, and these are the same thing, necessarily, same state. And the same thing here. So this goes away. This is just what did I do? Is just cancel these two lines and cancel these two lines. So this tells me that there is nothing on region one, which was the earlier conclusion we have. So what is left from here is something on region 2. So I have all from that comes from this trace is trace u2 
dagger, TB dagger. Okay, and this is a brilliant simplification because this is actually how you write uh, a line in the adjoint representation. Okay? So the, these two quarks effectively build uh, effective gluon in terms of color representation. This makes your life easier because when you are going to do the average with these things that are real gluons, you are averaging over just a joint object. So everything is in a single representation. Uh, this only works because these two quarks are iconal. Otherwise, they would have different coordinates and you couldn't build a gluon out of something that uh, was built from two lines with different uh, coordinates, okay? In that case, what you have to do, or option, is you rewrite all your adjoint lines in terms of fundamental lines. And then you have, so for each gluon, you have two lines. So in this case, for instance, here at the end, if this is, was all wobbly, uh, wobbly, you would have two, three, four, five, six Wilson lines uh, to do uh, an average of, okay? So six different coordinates. Okay, so with this, let me just write that as the, as the adjoint, if I find... So this is actually the one half. I'm going to forget about this one half in a second. Trace of u dagger b b bar on region two. Okay. So effective. Now, finally, for the medium averages. So now we have two things to calculate. It's in region two. What survives from there? So region two, I have G C B with these coordinates. And I have this this thing. And this is only has one coordinate, which is y, if it ever becomes uh, a concern. In region 3, I'll just have two g's. Okay, just a sanity check that all these indices uh, eventually contract. So I have CB bar, I have CA, and I have AC, yes. So uh, what I get on the cross-section is called a neutral. That's a, that's a good sign, okay? That didn't invent letters that... Uh... Okay, so these are the two uh, medium averages that need to be calculated in this game. Sorry? U B B bar is the joint line. It's this one. Huh? Which trace? There's no trace. Where's Here or here? Up. Up? Where? That's one half, That's one half yes. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing to trace over. It would be a... a, a yeah. Okay. So, this will just be uh, the Wilson line, and this contains a Wilson line, 
and a kinetic term. So here I'll have two kinetic terms, two Wilson. So in both cases, I have to average. So the kinetic term doesn't know anything about the medium, right? It's just a coordinate a velocity squared. So all the average will occur. It's the same one that has to be performed in both these cases. It's two joint Wilson lines, OK? So where does that leave? So in both cases, or both cases share uh, a thing, which is what on uh, I, I don't know in what state I was when I wrote these notes because there, there's things here that are just uh, shocking. Okay. Okay. There's something I already can observe. Is that in both these cases, uh, these so the only the only way of making this with two indices called a neutral is that the so there's only two free indices, right? In each one of them, this has to be proportional to the trace, and has to be those indices have to be equal. Okay, so this has to be delta C B bar. Normalize this way because of the trace, and it will be a trace or oops, average of the trace of G, no colors, U. But still the coordinates. And here this has to be proportional to B bar C. Same thing here, trace of G. Okay, next step is to write uh, what the G's and the U's are, uh, or first what the G's are um, explicitly, okay? You might have forgotten that there was a very nice, um, there was a very nice um, path integral representation for this. And finally, I think it will be palette in this business. So if this is something that goes from coordinate x to coordinate y, this could be written as a path integral that starts on x, ends in y, of an exponential of i, k plus, being the momentum, longitudinal momentum that is carried, of an integral between the beginning of times and the end of times, of velocity squared, which is a function of s, and a Wilson line with this coordinate, okay, which is also in the in the same time support. Okay, so there will be two parts to computing these things, uh, to computing those things. One is to do the medium averages of the Wilson lines, which is common for both that cases. And then is to perform the path integrals, which in one case I have one path integral, in the other case I have two. So in this case, I only have one, one path that changes because this coordinate is fixed. And here, both coordinates are dynamical. Funnily enough, the one with the two coordinates dynamical is easier than the other one, <laughs> which is, uh, this has no dot. Okay, so before writing anything to do with path integrals, I'm going to write the average of the Wilson lines.
that I need to find one sign not to write stupid things. Six, seven, eight. Okay. So in both cases, what I'll have is some u dagger of some coordinate r1, average with some u of coordinate r2. Okay? In one case, that coordinate is one of, one of them is fixed. In the other one, uh, it is not. Okay? Okay. So how do I do this? I remember what this means. What's the Wilson line? This is the time-ordered product of an exponential which has the medium insertions. Okay. This can be expanded. Order by order, so the next term is one of the, this is time ordered, so there is no half. Uh, or there is no half. Okay, and this is this thing again. So on and so forth. So what do I have to do? That uh, you can then entertain yourselves doing. I'm not going to do it on a blackboard. Uh, I'll have something like this and something that is the complex conjugate here. So change is a sign. I'm going to multiply this and only keep terms up to second order, okay, in the product. So those come from, uh, so I'll have a first order term that is one, Sorry, a zeroth order term that is one, one times one. I'll have two first order terms. So the structure of this product will be something like one plus something that is proportional to just a naught, okay? Plus something that is proportional to a naught squared where, where I have terms that are both from the second order so contact terms, they are on the same, they come from the same line. And things that come from the cross term. Okay, so there will be some A0, A0 in some sort of combination. When I take the average, this in my stochastic field is by definition zero. And this is what, where we started that this is some function of the difference of coordinates and it's local in time and local in color and whatever, okay? So this will be some, uh, what did I call it? Let's call it some sigma, okay? This is, uh, if this is R1, R2, this will be some sigma of R1, R2. Okay, okay so that's the, that's the way you build uh, one of these medium averages. Uh, you, no you notice this, okay? Uh, and then you say, um, I believe in exponentials, I believe in exponentials, I have two terms, uh, one something, and I re-exponentiate it and, uh, and put the, and get something that has exponential form, okay? In physics, you usually don't need to believe in things. Uh, so another way of doing this is that you expand this Wilson line in a slightly different way. You slice it in time and say, I'm going to do a very thin slice, let's say at the very end, okay? I calculate the, the average is local. I calculate the average there, and I still have the remaining of the Wilson line, okay? Now, what would happen if I now calculate the average at some other place? 
I'll get the same result. So I get 1 minus ig something from, from the average. And there, the exponentiation is, uh, is, is, is trivial because what I'll have is 1 minus something to the power n, which in the limit of n goes to infinity with 1 over n before is of an exponential. So there is no black magic, right? Um, I'm not Harry Potter. Or, uh, the first person that did this was not Harry Potter or something like that. Okay, so the result of this medium average, which I should have written explicitly somewhere, but something, everything seems to have disappeared from, this, from these papers, is just the exponential of minus, okay, there is a, there's a CA that appears here, which is the N, so the Casimir for a gluon, and then DS sigma R1 minus R2 times the density of scattering centers. Okay? So the medium average of two Wilson lines is always this thing. If these were these are a joint. If this were in the fundamental, the only thing that would change is that it would be a CF there for the, for the quark. Okay. So now we have to perform the path integrals. And I want to do a, an, opinion, an, an opinion poll here. When you were students at... Uh, before PhD, did you ever see path integrals? In which course? This is to settle a... Oh, was it quantum field theory of any sort the first place where you saw path integrals or did you see them in quantum mechanics? Everyone in quantum mechanics? No, there's no nose. Okay. No, that's very good. Because this, these path integrals that appear here are just path integrals over coordinates. So they are true quantum mechanical path integrals. There's no fields, right? I'm not integrating over uh, field configurations. I was asking this because in the past I've had people, um, people that were familiar with path integrals for fields finding it very strange that you also did it for coordinates. Um, so it's kind of a reversal of, uh, of history. And um, uh, so it's good. It's very good. OK. So now I have case 1 and 2, which are labeled regions 2 and 3. Let's see how to do the path integral of one of them. Or both of them, where in one case you can't do it. So if you did path integrals, you also know uh, what's the enormous class of path integrals that you actually can perform, right, explicitly. Yeah. It's kind of Gaussians, right? Yeah. So then what, whatever happens here, this has to be Gaussian, okay? It's, um, okay, so... If we go to case three, what we'll have to do is, let's see if I get the coordinates right. So there is a first path integral over some coordinate that I'll call R1, which starts at x1 bar and then in Z, okay? And this has so who is Dagger, who is not? I was very sloppy there.
So these, these ones are daggers, right? So this guy is necessarily a, a dagger, right? Okay. Okay, it just matters for, for one sign. So if this one is dagger, the there'll be a minus sign here, the path integral. Hmm. Call this k plus. Okay, so there is that integral over the time support. And I have R1 squared, okay? And I've already done the medium average for both of them. So the medium average for both of them is that other exponential. So that I'm going to write here. It's minus CA over 2, the same time, the same time integral of sigma R1 minus R2 and some density of scattering centers. Okay, so the only thing that changes for R2 are the endpoints, which are now x and z. So this one was completely wrong. This is x like that. It's just copying from there and not being able to see in all the distances. That Okay, and the, because this one is not daggered, the sign is positive, so I put a minus sign there. Okay, so this is the path integral I have to, I have to evaluate for the case of uh, zone three. So I see something nice here. The complicated part only depends on the difference of coordinates. So it's a nice idea to do a change of variables. So I can write some variable v, that is r1 minus r2, and some coordinate u, which is the, so it's relative, relative coordinate and center of mass, more or less, okay? Uh, this has Jacobian one, so I don't have to worry about any prefactors. This becomes V, and this becomes, so this is the difference of squares, so it's one, yeah? It's what? If it's a difference of squares, becomes just some times difference, so it's uh, two times U times, U dot times V dot, okay. So this is two times U dot times v dot. Okay, so this has a nicer, a nicer look. And now what I do, remember, what is here is a classical action. So I can uh, use uh, Euler Lagrange equations. So if I take Euler Lagrange for u, Okay, uh, it's only the term with uh, u dot, that derivative gives me v dot, right? v dot that I have to differentiate in time, so it's v dot dot is equal to zero. Which means that v dot is a constant, okay? Uh, which is some sort of relative velocity that is very easy to very easy to do. It's uh, v final minus v initial divided by final time or by the whatever interval in in time. Okay. So it's the difference of coordinates at the end point which is x minus z. Minus 
x1 bar minus x divided by this. Okay, and I can write then v as a function of time. So this is so classical, it's a classical trajectory. Okay. So that v follows a straight line. That's what that thing tells us, right? There's no, no acceleration. And that straight line that I can write in many different ways, there's a particularly nice way of writing it. Let's call this v classical. I can write this, let's call this time s, s minus this coordinate divided by delta x plus, x bar minus z, plus uh, sorry, this is the initial time that I had kind of forgotten where it, where it was. And okay, there would be an infinity here. I don't want to write any, I want only to make things infinite at at the end, so this is x, x infinity plus minus s delta x plus times x1 bar minus x. Okay, so this is my, my trajectory. I don't need to always write it so explicitly. So what has happened here is that this has become, even before doing any path integral, just this times v dot, which is a constant. So it's just this constant, vf minus vi divided by the time interval. Okay, so out of the integral. And then it's the integral of u dot. Okay, the integral of u dot is u final minus u, u initial. Okay, and then the rest, let's call this n. Uh, here, there is, there is nothing I can do, right? Or is there? There is one thing I can do, which is not doing much, is that because of this, this has been collapsed to the classical trajectory. So there, there are no longer, there's no longer a path integral in, uh, in or oh, there are path integrals, but this does not depend on the path integral because this trajectory has been fixed. So all of this, just after this manipulation, uh, does not depend on the path because the path has been set. So the solution of this path integral is to keep this exponential as is and perform two path integrals of their identity, which just gives the the path area, okay, which is that funny normalization that uh, path integrals uh, have. So the only thing that will survive from here after, so of course there will be that color thing, the n squared goes with the trace, so there's no, so this is just, two path, integral in, uh, path integrations of the identity. So, and then an exponential where everything is uh, fixed.
Okay. Now uh, a question. What does this mean? Okay, these are numbers, doesn't matter. So this is a phase where everything is fixed, right? And this is just the thing that was inherited from uh, um, two, uh, two Wilson lines. Yeah. So this is just, this here is just classical um, Brownian motion. Just broadening. Okay, this is just broadening of the momentum of the of the of the gluon line. Okay, so all the rest doesn't doesn't matter. There's the phase there, and there is this uh, this classical. This is a classical term. I mean, this is a potential or a cross a dipole cross section evaluated in the classical path. Okay, so in this case irrespectively of what this is, I really have a closed form with no path integrals left to do. So everything kind of disappears. That's not the case here. So here we can see very easily what's, what's going to happen just looking, at the, just looking at the calculation here. Okay, what, what's, what's going to happen? This is going to be exactly the same because this was the average of the, of the Wilson lines, okay? But now, this thing doesn't exist and this integral doesn't exist, okay? So I'll have uh, that coordinate sitting there, okay? And there is no easy way, so this will be R1 minus Y, where Y is a fixed coordinate. And I can say, okay, if it's a fixed coordinate, I can kind of shift variables, and then it disappears from the derivative, but I'll still be left with a path integral that has a kinetic term and a potential term. And there is nothing I can do about it, unless I specify this form of this potential, the so-called harmonic oscillator approximation, where this is quadratic in the difference of coordinates then it's easy, because if it's quadratic, that's quadratic, that's a Gaussian, a Gaussian integration I can, I can do. Otherwise, I'm stuck with the path integrals kind of forever. And that's that curly K I, I wrote today, which is, what, how is that interpreted in region two? So that's the broadening of the gluon respective to this fixed direction of, uh, of the quarks. Okay, um, so that's how I'll start uh, tomorrow. But the, the okay, the lesson here is that if you do things in general, you get to these path integrals, which are not necessarily um, solvable. And, okay, solvable. Okay, uh, you can write them. Uh, everybody knows that path integrals are not good to calculate anything that is of use at the end. Um, so what you what you do is that, okay. I specify there the um, that thing as being the harmonic uh, oscillator potential. So it's q hat times the difference of the of the or times the difference of the coordinates that appear there squared. So then I can do the path integral, and this is one approximation. Another approximation is that I can expand this order by order in the, in the number of scatterings. Each one of these things represents one scattering, right? So the first order correction would be the opacity one. In that case, I can also complete the, do the path interval, okay? Because the path intervals will be just of three things. The non-trivial part of the potential factorizes. It's in a fixed place. Okay, I can do that. And then I can do better, okay? Keeping this generic, I can write uh, Dyson equations, again, uh, for the evolution of this K. This K is a Green's function of the coherent state of a gluon in the quark. So it's like a 
propagator, it's not like it is the propagator of a two states uh, of a two particle system. Okay, and you, I can write recursive equations for that. Uh, I can plug them back into my spectrum uh, so that I can write a recursive equation for that as well. And that one can be evaluated numerically. So it's a mix analytic numeric for an arbitrary potential. I mean, if I'm going to do numerics, I have to say what the potential is. And, but I can do things that otherwise are not possible, like this, like a Yukawa potential, a high thermal loop potential, whatever. Okay, so that's the, uh, how this, however, formally, to do calculations, this path, path integral approach is extremely um, nice to get to this stage. Of course, this gets complicated. And gets complicated, for instance, so that's the exercise. Gets complicated if you, oh, this is wet. Um, gets complicated if you want to do the following. Think of a um, slightly more complicated case. So for instance, if I had kept all the particles non-iconal, right? So I would have these medium averages of four Wilson lines, six Wilson lines, okay? Those are challenging by themselves, so before any path integral. And then I would have, instead of two path integrals, I could have up to six path integrals. Uh, it's not nice, okay? And uh, becomes uh, extremely, extremely, extremely messy, uh, or at least in our current uh, current uh, abilities. So um, this was not very interactive, sorry, but I wanted to show this this calculation. Uh, um, but people have calculated medium averages and path integrals for these. Uh, uh, Many of them, okay? Um, some right, some wrong, including myself, mostly on the second part. Um, but uh, so any questions, anything? I think it's the, the time to, so tomorrow I'll leave shortly after the, the lecture. So if you want to ask me anything that I may be able to answer. Um, it's a good time. Otherwise, we go and have coffees and <laughs> just saw the. I like that sticker. It immediately tells where you come from. <laughs> where that never happens, right? Huh? Where that never happens. No. Never rains in. Um, in Santiago, never rains, yes. <laughs> no? So we, we can talk in the, in the corridors. <laughs>